Our next speaker is Kevin Rice um, from the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. Um, he's going to speak to us about design formulation and testing of systematically dosed peptides and polymer DNA and mRNA nanoparticles for gene delivery. Awesome. Thanks uh, to the organizers for the uh, opportunity to speak today, Dr. Sullivan and uh, Dr. Ziotti, uh, for chairing the session. Um, un I appreciate the, the comments of the last speaker as well for giving us an interesting view into uh, the development of lipid nanoparticles and microfluidics. I'm an academic, uh, and so I don't develop gene delivery systems to sell a product, uh, but I like to develop concepts to advance gene delivery systems. And so I view uh, this educational session today is an opportunity to at least uh, see the world of gene delivery at least a little bit the way I do today. And so by starting out, I wanted to just contrast something that we don't talk about enough around here, which is viral versus non-viral gene delivery. And I've been in this society for 20 years, and so I've seen it change a lot. And of course, there's a lot of excitement now in the non-viral community, not only about physical methods, but also about lipid nanoparticles. And so. If we compare viral and non-viral delivery systems, I think we can fairly say uh, that viruses such as adeno, lenti, even some of the oncolytic viruses, for example, and AAV, are more efficiently expressed than virtually all of our non-viral delivery systems. However, we can also say that viruses are immunogenic, and that's one of their Achilles heels, which means they can't be multi-dosed. And because of that, uh, and the fact that they integrate, means that you're really limited uh, with what you can do with a virus from a systemic dosing point of view. Now, I don't mean to be too harsh on the viral crowd. There's probably some of you here in this room. Uh, but, uh, and maybe you're here to learn about how to deliver uh, DNA and RNA non-virally. Um, I will tell you that this is still an evolution, the non-viral development. We have our own problems. Even though we're, uh, lipid nanoparticles, for example, are more suitable for chronic dosing, and they've been successfully shown to deliver siRNA and mRNA, they're certainly still somewhat less efficient. That, that doesn't mean they can't be efficacious. They can be. They're certainly also less immunogenic. And I think it's fair to say that both DNA and mRNA have proven to be non-integrating, at least if you're not trying to integrate. So that's a good thing. Now, I view this a little bit as the race of the hare and the tortoise. And starting out 20 years ago, of course, the hare took off like crazy. The viral people were winning and they could show us that they could express genes everywhere. But as in the, the tail of the hare and the tortoise, the hare slows down and stops, and the slow, steady pace of the tortoise eventually catches up and passes. And so in this case, a couple things happened that helped us to pass the viral people. First of all, uh, siRNA happened. And it's true that it's not possible to deliver an siRNA by virus, at least safely, because you'll capture the microRNA environment and you'll cause great harm. So you have to deliver it non-virally. And of course, most sRNAs are packaged and they're synthetic. The other thing that happened is CRISPR-Cas9. And of course, we know now it's not very safe to deliver Cas9 by a virus because you'll carve up the genome. And if you do that, you'll cause harm uh, to the cell as well. So I think that these two non-viral uh, procedures uh, that are currently being practiced have put us in the lead currently, at least from systemically delivered gene delivery systems. So the morals of the story are slow and steady wins the race, and thinking long-term and acting on principle is necessary to succeed. Now, how about the status of non-viral delivery? We've heard about lipid nanoparticles, and a nice talk uh, just a moment ago by uh, Ewan. Lipid nanoparticles have their advantages. They're able to encapsulate sRNA and mRNA. They target hepatocytes, but I think one of their Achilles heels is the reason they target hepatocytes is they absorb ApoE in the blood. And that's their targeting ligand. And then they bind to the LDL receptor, and they're taken up by, by hepatocytes. And they, of course, contain an endosomal escape lipid that helps them deliver both RNAi and mRNA to hepatocytes. And if you want to read a nice review on this, Peter Cullis published in our journal, the Journal of the Society, in 2017, a nice review. I'd recommend it. Now, alnylam, on the other hand, has done both sRNA delivery of lipid nanoparticles, but now turned to molecular conjugates, such as these Galnac sRNA molecular conjugates, recognizing that lipid nanoparticles have some limitations. And these conjugates 
are modified with a targeting ligand. They represent a direct conjugate of an RNAi to a targeting ligand that targets the acyloglycoprotein receptor on hepatocytes. However, they suffer a little bit from potency because of lack of an endosomal escape mechanism. Now, just as a reminder to you, the specificity of the acyloglycoprotein receptor is a trimeric receptor in the liver that binds to an n glycan ligand. And alnylam has developed this drug uh, that enters the hepatocytes and, of course, is able to release enough of the sRNA in order to affect uh, therapy. And in fact, they're in phase two clinical trial uh, with their drug. But I want to remind you as well that the targeting moiety on this drug is in fact a galnac neoglycopeptide. And just a, a credit to my former advisor, Johns Hopkins, this was developed in the 1980s as a neoglycopeptide by him. It's really fulfilling to see it now turned into a phase two clinical trial drug for targeting RNAi. Now, today I'd like to contrast with you uh, lipid nanoparticles and peptide nanoparticles. A peptide nanoparticle, by definition, is one that uh, binds DNA, mRNA, sRNA by a peptide or maybe even a polymer, if you will. And these have the advantages of allowing direct mixing as opposed to multi-component mixing. They also um, circulate, they have circulatory stability, meaning they don't directly target to hepatocytes in the liver. Um, and their stability has been shown is much greater for DNA delivery than it is for mRNA delivery. mRNA is very susceptible to metabolism. Um, they can also carry a variable targeting ligand. In this case, proteins can be put on the surface, and I'll give an example today of carbohydrates put on the surface. Now, if you compare that to the lipid nanoparticle, again, the microfluidic mixing components is a multi-component process which is probably a little bit complicated and not necessarily amendable to every laboratory. The circulatory stability is greater than the case of peptide DNA nanoparticles because the mRNA or DNA is completely capsulated inside. And the targeting, as I already mentioned, is completely APOE. So the question is, in this new heron tortoise race, who wins? And who wins depends upon the following things in my estimation. It comes down to, like the case of the viral delivery system, immune activation. Who has less immune activation? The second thing is, is retargeting. If you can only target the liver because of APOE, then it has limited utility. People want to target solid cancer, solid tumors, and other locations as well. Persistence. How long does it express? Currently, the lipid nanoparticles can only encapsulate and deliver mRNA. And as I'll show, the persistence of an mRNA expression system is relatively short compared to DNA. And finally, potency. Uh, which of these systems is more potent, meaning can you multi-dose it, will it last long enough so that you can avoid all immune activation? And what you try to avoid is the innate immune system. Immunogenicity is what the viral people ran into, but they also ran into this. And in fact, the lipid nanoparticles, when you encapsulate them with mRNA, some of the mRNA ends up on the surface of the nanoparticle. And that mRNA then is delivered directly to toll-like receptors. And toll-like receptors exist in your, on your endothelial cells, as well as some of the hepatocytes, macrophages. And they recognize double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA, and CPG DNA. With DNA, we can get rid of most of the CPGs and eliminate the toll-like receptor response. But with mRNA, if any of it's exposed on the surface of the particle, now you're delivering up um, a ligand to toll-like receptors causing the innate immune response, which tips the balance of various types of, um, of inflammatory uh, 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 proteins that you produce, which then causes this innate immune response. And that's what shuts down the clinical trials, the inability to get around this innate immune response. And that's why alnalum has gone to the Galnac conjugates to avoid this whole issue. Now, if we're going to package DNA or mRNA, the very first thing that you have to deal with is metabolism. And so I pulled up some very old data here from my group to show you that if you take plasma DNA and just incubate it in mouse serum, you can see that depending on the mouse serum, it only lasts a few hours, and there's plenty of DNA in mouse serum that will metabolize plasma DNA into fragments. If you radio label the DNA and do the same experiment in mouse and now auto radiograph a gel, you see it's a much faster process. So there's a difference between the DNA in the serum or the blood and what happens in the animal. And the difference is the liver. Mice have liver, the DNA ends up in the liver, it's metabolized, whereas in the in vitro experiment, that's not happening. So this leads people then to package DNA or mRNA to try to avoid the metabolism 
as the very first step. And early on, or on some number of years ago, we developed this pegylated peptide. So I'll use a few examples of our own research today to illustrate key points. Now I'll point out some features of this uh, type of system. This is a polylysine peptide, and you'll notice it has these acridine residues attached to the side chain of lysine, and then through a linker onto cis, it has a single peg, and this is a 5 kilodalton peg. And the good thing about this type of delivery system is you're going to develop delivery systems of this type, of a peptide type. You really want to have very good control over your chemistry. It's key, and that's a take-home message. We can prepare this kind of molecule, the peptide component, by solid phase synthesis using this synthetic molecule in which the acridine is attached to the lysine side chain. And this is then put into solid phase synthesis to position the acridines where we want them. You have to be able to HPLC purify products. You have to be able to attach pegs. And typically, you get these types of yields. And of course, it's quite scalable. Now, the, the reason we went with such a molecule is if you look at DNA and how most people try to package DNA, it's through ionic interaction. So the side chains of a lysine peptide would bind to the I phosphate backbone of DNA. And of course, this works well to package DNA. In fact, it's the same principle how PEI packages DNA through ionic interaction. The problem is this, is that the overall particle becomes positively charged. Not only that, if you try to develop short peptides to do this, you find out that the size of the peptide influences the particle size. And if you get to a large enough particle size, uh, that a, a large enough peptide to shrink the particles to a small size, now you have stability problems in vivo. And so the only way around it is to develop very long polylysines, and those then become very positively charged, and it's impossible to control the chemistry, the pegylation chemistry, the liganding chemistry, everything else that you want to go on that. So the solution to develop short peptides is to make them higher affinity, and you do so by building in intercalator dyes. And the intercalator in this case leads to polyintercalation. It still has ionic binding. And now it's a very high affinity short peptide that can be released uh, once this gets inside the nucleus. <clears throat> now, just a real quick slide, I hope, that shows you that we just didn't come up with that single peptide. We did a fair bit of optimization around this molecule shown here. And so we first identified that lysine was the best spacing amino acid between a series of, of arginines. And by the way, uh, these assays were also followed, uh, these experiments were followed by doing pharmacokinetics on nanoparticles, DNA nanoparticles, radioactive DNA nanoparticles, and gene expression experiments, uh, luciferase expression in animals uh, with the DNA nanoparticles. So lysine is the best spacing amino acid, and the number of spacing amino acids turns out to be four or five. And so in the final molecule, it was four. And the spacing, uh, the peptide actually is influenced strongly as well by the linker chemistry that links the peg. And in this case, we tried all these linker chemistries, and the peg malamid turns out to be the best in terms of metabolic stability. We also varied the peg length across the range and found out that 5 kilodalton turns out to be the best in terms of the desirable properties that we wanted. So if you look at the metabolic stability now of the DNA particles, a radioactive DNA nanoparticle of this type made with the optimal peptide not only leads to in vitro stability, but leads to a couple hours of circulatory stability in the animal. This is pharmacokinetic data where the DNA is extracted back, run on a gel, and autoradiographed. And we can show as well, I won't show it today, but it's in the publications, that if you, uh, if you treat the animals just right in terms of expression, you can lead to stable expression, or you, you can show that those nanoparticles uh, can express luciferase uh, for very long times, so up to four hours in the circulation in animals. Now, one of the key concepts I think people need to understand is that DNA nanoparticles are positively charged. Even our particles are positively charged. If you make a PEI DNA nanoparticle, and many of you have done this and transfected in cells, the zeta potential is about 20 to 30 millivolts. And that leads to the robust gene transfer you see in cell culture due to ionic binding to the cell surface. But if you dose that particle in vivo, what happens is that it's going to, uh, it's going to aggregate. And I'll show that in a second. Alternatively, if you take uh, a peptide, a peg peptide, you notice that the zeta potential drops to about 15 millivolts. And this is due to what we call shielding of the charge. There's still internal charge of the polylysine, but it's now being shielded by the peg. So one of the key fundamental features is that DNA nanoparticles bind albumin. So a charged particle that's unshielded will bind albumin. And you think that it's going to stay about its size, but in the case of unshielded particles, they aggregate. And this is the phenomenon that you'll see 
where a DNA nanoparticle that's unshielded and stable will end up in the lung and cause lung embolisms in animals. And PEI will do this and actually cause death in the animals due to this feature. It's not a thing you want. Alternatively, uh, poly, uh, DNA nanoparticles that are pegylated also bind albumin. And here's the zeta potential data to show you if you titrate in albumin with it at about four to five mg per mil, you actually get a minus uh, charge of the, of, the, of the DNA nanoparticle. Now this turns out to be a key concept. The idea that the charge of the particle changes when you dose it due to protein binding. This was known in the early 2000s, but what it leads to was not well appreciated. When you look at the biodistribution of DNA nanoparticles, you see this effect. Now, I've only shown a few tissues here, but this accounts for most of the activity, and you'll see that these stabilized pegylated DNA nanoparticles distribute to the liver. But what you, don't, what you see as well is that on dose escalation up to 100 micrograms, you begin to saturate the liver. So the percent of dose goes down. So if you plot this a little differently, you actually get a saturation curve. And the saturation curve is, in fact, these DNA nanoparticles saturating uh, scavenger receptors on Kupfer cells. So it's these guys. Kupfer cells that live within the liver, they're resident macrophages. And it's well known that, that these scavenger receptors, SRA1, binds to anionic ligands. But what was not appreciated was that they bind to positively charged DNA nanoparticles that reverse their charge upon dosing due to albumin binding. And this is a key concept. So no matter what happens, your particle either will be positive, ending up negative. If it's near neutral, it'll be neutral. But if it starts out negative, it ends up getting captured by the scavenger receptor as well. Trying to outrun scavenger receptors, which also cause innate immune response, is a big problem. And the viral people have the same problem as well. So this is an unsolved problem in the nano world. Now, one of the things you can do is try to hide the charge. In this example, we grow the length of the peg up to 30 kilodaltons. And you can see that you can hide the charge so that when you get to zero millivolts of charge, you actually get very uh, low uptake or no uptake in the liver uh, relative to particles that have much higher charge. But it's not practical to use 30 kilodalton pegs because if you're going to do bioconjugate chemistry on these, it becomes nearly impossible. So a small particle size is necessary to reach hepatocytes. This is another key concept. DNA, as looked at by atomic force, can be seen like this. You can almost pick out an individual plasmid here. If you take a look at a DNA nanoparticle, and this is a recent image of DNA nanoparticles by AFM, you can see that they're spherical. But you have to be careful. These are flattened. They're pancaked. And so their size is somewhat exaggerated relative to their height. Most of the time, we use dynamic light scattering, just as Ewan talked about as, or, uh, as the main way in which people characterize the size of DNA nanoparticles. Why is size important has to do with the liver. And this is a, a picture of the sinusoid of liver, the smallest vesicles in the liver. Here's that macrophage here. And in fact, it's these cells that line this sinusoid called fenestrated endothelial cells that matter here. A picture of those is shown here by the elegant work of Weiss in these two references. And you can see the sinusoid, and now you can see these fenestrated endothelial cells, these small micro holes. If you pick out one of these cells and show it in, in a, in a blown-up fashion, you can begin to see that these are the 100 nanometer pores people talk about that the DNA nanoparticles have to traverse. Now, notice it's not strictly 100. In mice, the average is 141. In humans, it's 107. And this is a distribution of size of particles as well, of, of the pores in the fenestra. So you've got a size distribution of particles fitting over a size distribution of pores. But there's no doubt that smaller is better if you want to penetrate the liver and finally get to the hepatocytes. Now, one recent piece of data I'll share with you is a technique in which we were taking nanoparticles and looking at them under AFM, and we realized the reason that they're a little bit larger is they contain multiple plasmids. If you let them sit there long enough, on EFM, they kind of explode into a popcorn structure. And then if you look carefully at this, you see that there's actually a larger number of plasmids in here. It would calculate to be about 26 plasmids in a rather large 150 nanometer particle. But upon heating these particles in a procedure, we learned that we can shrink these now into a size range that'll fit through the fenestrated endothelia. And this is still work in progress, but we think this will have a huge impact on the nano field to develop small DNA nanoparticles with a manipulation of this type. 
And I want to talk about targeting for just a moment. You all know that to get uh, nanoparticles into the hepatocytes or into cells, it requires a targeting ligand. After they enter, they have to undergo endosomal escape. If it's DNA-based, they have to enter the nucleus. Certainly, there needs to be a lot of work done on new ligands and attaching those ligands. Endosomal escape remains a weakness in the field, and so does nuclear targeting. There's ways to bypass this with a physical method, such as hydrodynamic dosing. <clears throat> I won't talk at all about those subjects of endosomal escape and nuclear targeting, but again, they're very important to advance the field. Hydrodynamic dosing, though, is an important crutch and a necessary procedure uh, that we've used for many years, coupled with bioluminescence imaging, in order to test formulations that are partially developed, meaning having targeting ligands but not endosomal escape or nuclear targeting yet. And still you have to test them for efficacy. And this is born out of the ideas of Dexy Liu and also John Wolfe, uh, who published this in the 1990s. If you're not familiar with the technique, it's uh, tail vein dosing of a large volume very rapidly. And if you follow that 24 hours with an IP dose of luciferin, just dosing one microgram of a plasmid that contains luciferase, you'll end up with landing in the standard curve if you will, on the IBIS imaging system. And we've developed this into a calibrated method so we can quantify the degree of luciferase expression in liver. We've also advanced this into something called hydrodynamic stimulation. And in this version of it, we take a one microgram dose of DNA, and if we deliver it first and wait five minutes and then follow it with a hydrodynamic stimulatory dose, wait 24 hours, and then dose luciferin, obviously we wouldn't see any expression because the, the plasma DNA would be completely destroyed in the circulation. However, if we take a polyplex or a nanoparticle and dose it, now it's stable in the circulation, not just for five minutes, but for up to four hours. And in doing that, if we wait five minutes up to four hours, then hydrodynamically stimulate with saline, 24 hours later we can get full level expression. So not only are these DNA nanoparticles expressible under hydrodosing, they circulate and you can delay the hydrostimulation dose and use this as a way to study the pharmacokinetics and circulatory stability of these nanoparticles when they're still incomplete in terms of delivery. Now, finally, I want to give just an example of the kinds of things you can do in targeting. Um, I mentioned the acyloglycoprotein receptor early on, and so we're interested in this to attach ligands to the ends of pegs and onto the stabilizing pe uh, polyacridine peptide. To do this um, really takes some uh, pretty uh, I would say significant chemistry. Uh, we developed this molecule some time ago in which you can take the triantenary, which has a tyrosine, and link the peg onto it, and then in a, in a step where you can uh, then put a malamid on this and then couple it to the cysteine, you can build this kind of molecule. But I do think that these kinds of constructs are exotic and that what the field needs is simpler chemistry in order to attach virtually any type of ligand onto the surface of these DNA nanoparticles. And that would set these apart, set them apart from lipid nanoparticles in the retargeting area. Now, these kinds of molecules, though, uh, can be built with different peptides. And I mentioned this one producing 15 millivolt nanoparticles. But if we, if we trim this down, where we still have five acridines and this time five lysines, we can create a nanoparticle that only has positive five millivolts. And if we actually take away one single lysine residue from this one, we end up with reversing the charge down to minus 5 millivolts. So there's a very delicate balance on the peptide structure and the resulting charge of the nanoparticle, and this can only be achieved by having full control over the peptide chemistry and designing it. We're obviously giving away a little bit of stability here, but in order to manipulate the charge. And if you look at the biodistribution of these, you see that the targeting uh, nanoparticles perform best in vivo in terms of liver uptake if they have a positive charge or a slightly negative charge, whereas if it's a strongly positive charge, there's really no distinction between these particles in terms of liver uptake. Likewise, if you hydrodynamically stimulate with a particle that's slightly positive charge, you can see uh, that, in fact, uh, this performs better than the negative control with no glycan present on it. So these just represent examples of how to achieve some type of targeting and demonstrate it in vivo. Now, finally, I want to talk for a few minutes a very few minutes, on mRNA versus DNA. And we've worked with both, and I think that we're in a fair position to contrast these two. The advantages of mRNA that people talk about is it doesn't need to enter the nucleus, which is true. You can deliver it to the cytosol and have it express, as demonstrated eloquently, like from the lipid nanoparticles. They also claim it has no, sense, uh, no chance for insertion. 
uh, into uh, the genome. Uh, and I think the DNA probably is the same. Um, the sh expression is short term, and this is an advantage potentially for s proteins such as Cas9. But there's so many disadvantages as well. First of all, RNase is very susceptible to degradation. Secondly, we've already talked about innate immune response. The expression of therapeutic proteins is extremely short on the order of days. And uh, it's expensive and complex to produce relative to DNA. In terms of the potency of mRNA versus DNA, some of our own uh, published data in this area shows that you can get on par almost if you design the proper type of mRNA. And this is on a weight basis, a PGL3 plasmid, which is only an SV40 promoter, and a fully optimized, codon optimized, which has the proper UTRs built into it, um, mRNA dosed hydrodynamically and expressed in liver. And, you know, I would say that, that this is a fair comparison, except for you could put a CMV promoter uh, in that plasmid and it would go up 100 fold. So DNA still has an advantage on a weight basis in terms of potency by at least 100 fold. Persistence. This is data from our group that shows that even an optimized uh, nanoparticle of this type actually only has persistence out to about three or four days uh, and then it falls off. There's examples that are a little bit better in the literature out to seven or eight, nine days. This is the Myris Bio P live vector. Dexy Lu talked about this this morning and it's on the order of eight months. So you can do these things by having a proper promoter in this, in this case an albumin promoter that just cranks protein forever, all, both hydrodynamically dosed. So it's night and day. And there doesn't seem a way to improve the stability, I'm, I'm sorry, the persistence of mRNA. We've been trying. There are some systems out there, but very difficult. So you're really talking about a multi-dosing system by definition. And again, if it's multi-dosed, the chances of innate immune response increase. Now, to overcome some of this, we developed something kind of unique, and I'll tout it for just a second here, called double-stranded uh, mRNA. In this example, we actually paired the forward mRNA with the reverse complementary mRNA. And in these two, they differ in that the UTRs are either not hybridized or hybridized by the reverse construct. And what you can see is that these, band, these will form double-stranded mRNAs. And in fact, they tremendously increase the metabolic stability of the mRNA. So that problem can be tackled by this approach. Here you have single-stranded mRNA, single-stranded mRNA nanoparticle, and the percent or the amount of RNAs that can, you can lay on it and digest it with. And you notice when you get up to double-stranded mRNA, it's as good as a DNR, DNA mRNA or M, single-stranded mRNA nanoparticle. And in fact, as a, as a nanoparticle, double-stranded mRNA is virtually invincible to RNA's challenge. We thought that that would translate to greater persistence. But if you look at this under direct hydrodosing, single-stranded mRNA, double-stranded mRNA have the same degree of persistence. The reverse strand doesn't stop the forward mRNA from expressing, but it doesn't lead to any greater persistence. <clears throat> In terms of circulatory stability, this is a summary of some recent data, and I'll just kind of quickly walk you through it. Single-stranded mRNA will hydrodose to give you a high level of expression, but as soon as you take the nanoparticle and even try a five-minute circulatory stability experiment, it fails. Double-stranded mRNA improves a bit, but again, this is one in which we haven't covered up the UTRs or the poly-A tail. If we cover up the UTRs, we improve the experiment more, so that it's less susceptible to a five-minute circulatory stability experiment, but you can see we lose almost a log, and only when we fully cover both UTRs and make a complete reverse complement of the poly-A tail can we increase the stability of the, of the uh, forward mRNA, but not nearly as significantly as we can increase the stability of DNA, which can circulate for four hours with the same peptide. So the conclusions. Short peg peptides can package DNA into small, stable, biocompatible nanoparticles, and protein binding in the blood will alter the particle no matter what you do, and it can even mask the ligand if you're not careful. And Kufr cells, of course, are going to take up these particles, and they're part of that innate immune response. The particle size and the charge um, are key uh, parameters in terms of achieving targeting. So you have to have exquisite chemistry in order to control that. I think this is a key point, perhaps an opinion of mine. Metabolic instability and lower potency, short expression, um, and the potential for innate immune response um, are significant drawbacks to mRNA versus DNA. So 
Lipid nanoparticles have led the way by demonstrating successful delivery of mRNA and sRNA, and currently they're the rabbit in the lead. But the field awaits the next wave of innovations to develop either lipid nanoparticle peptides or polymers that can deliver DNA efficiency efficiently when systemically dosed. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my group um, of workers, that researchers that have been with me. This group of scientists developed these concepts over many years, and this is my current research group right now, and thank NIH for funding as well. Thanks, Kevin. That was great. Questions? Please step up to the microphone. Kevin, I have a question about the, uh, the measurement of the fenestra in the different species. Um, was that all done by the same methodology, or do you think that variability there is because of measurement di difference, differences in how the measurements were done? No, I think it's bona fide. Um, this guy Weiss, and I provided two references, published a paper in 85 and then another one in gene therapy much later, both of which directed um, detailed anatomical measurements of the fenestra of different species. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only does he describe the average diameter of the fenestra, but he talks about that the fenestra changes throughout the liver. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a continuum of the same size. It starts out smaller, it gets bigger, and then gets smaller as you enter it and leave a, a venule. A lot of people are known to have anti-PEG uh, uh, antibodies. How does that affect the uh, nanoparticles? PDG antibodies? No, PEG. PEG. PEG antibodies. PEG. Yeah, so that's another story. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, gene formulation yet producing PEG antibodies because I don't think there's a gene formulation that have been put through humans to that degree. Um, what you're really referring to, though, uh, is certain uh, drug formulations that are pegylated. There's a PEG scare. And you can produce an antibody against PEG, and so that's a reason to replace PEG. I've seen several attempts of people substituting uh, with different substitutions, and I think the problem is those things will be immunogenic as well. There's only a subpopulation of people that are immunogenic to PEG. Um, and as far as I know, it's, it, it's not a, a, uh, an acute immunogenicity, meaning it, a person has a, a reaction and kills them. They just can't take the drug anymore. In fact, you can screen for this using pharmacogenomics to determine whether or not they're going to have PEG allergy or not. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. Very, very great overview. Uh, I just want to go back to this heat shrink in nanoparticles you, you, you just took. Could you just exp you know, give a little, a little bit more insight? Thank sure. You. For you, I will. <laughs> uh, so um, we've been looking for a way to decrease the size of nanoparticles, DNA nanoparticles, for a long time. Uh, many, many people have been thrown at it. And I mentioned Basil Matthew, he's in the audience, uh, came into the group as a postdoc. And I'll, uh, when a postdoc tells you, think, don't think outside the box, throw away the box, uh, then you know that you've got a real postdoc who's going to try some things. So um, he came in and tried a bunch of things. What we do know is that um, it's very much dependent on the PEG peptide or the peptide, the actual particle size. And larger particles, and Asim, you've actually worked in this area a little bit, and Millie, you've even published a little bit in this area. Larger particles almost always have multiple plasmids, and so some of the thought leaders have talked about how to separate the plasmids to get them into smaller, uh, get them separated from each other so that the peptide would condense them into individual ones. So the heat method um, involves a high temperature of heating. I think the slide integrated, indicated 100 degrees C. And what we think is happening, in fact, is that we're partially um, denaturing the DNA. And the trick isn't to denature it too much and also to do it enough, so there's a time factor. It turns out to be buffer dependent, okay? Certain buffers work. And it also turns out uh, to be PEG peptide dependent somewhat, but it's pretty broad in terms of the number of kinds of molecules we tried and it's worked. And I don't want to give away too much more than that because we're trying to write it up and uh, I know that even though I'm an academic and I told you that, you know, I just like to think up concepts, occasionally we do, you know, protect intellectual property. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, Kevin. Great. Thank you very much, Kevin.